think the sightings first started up about 10 years ago. That's the same time my family moved to this town. I was only 12 at the time. Since then, many have claimed to have seen some sort of wolf or hyena-like animal running around. Supposedly, it roams the forest right next to our neighborhood at night. I went around and interviewed the eyewitnesses. Every description was the same. They said it has thick brown fur and bright blue eyes. It also has the ability to stand on its hind legs and is about my height when not fully upright. These sightings are common enough that even the law enforcement officers believe in this werewolf. They say there are no officially recorded wolves or mountain lions or any other similar animals in this area. That could explain the sightings. They've also tried to catch it more than once, but it clearly has human level intelligence since it has always been able to evade them. And no one knows where it goes during the day. And the sightings just seem to get more and more common as the years flew by, to the point where even my parents had claimed to see it once or twice. My mother says she saw it running across a road while driving home from work, late at night, while my father said he saw it creeping around our front yard before leaping over the fence and running back into the woods where it lurks. Everyone in this town claims to have seen this werewolf at some point, except for me. I don't believe in the thing. Why should I? Everyone knows eyewitness accounts are the least reliable form of evidence, since they can easily be fabricated, exaggerated, or misinterpreted. That said, just recently some extremely convincing physical evidence has been found. For instance, some people have photographed large footprints clearly canine in origin, but much larger than that of a fox or coyote. More gruesomely, hikers have been finding carcasses with their necks and spines, violently snapped open with powerful bone-crushing jaws. Ever since these deaths turned up, everyone in town has been keeping their pets and livestock indoors at night for safety, especially since the creature seems to be losing its fear of humans, hence the recent sightings of it in urban areas. One of our elderly neighbors even claimed she saw it digging through her garbage right by her window. She says it turned right in her direction before going over to the window, pressing its muzzle against the glass and breathing powerful hungry breath before she ran to her bedroom, pulled the blanket over her head and stayed there until morning. After hearing that story, I knew I had to get to the bottom of this. Even if it wasn't a werewolf, there was clearly something in our town wreaking havoc. Maybe a feral dog or even an escaped hyena that someone was keeping as an illegal exotic pet. I decided I was going to try and catch the creature on film myself, no matter how difficult it would be. I set up a camouflage tent in the backyard, right next to the forest, and brought with me a headlamp, a video camera, and a gun. The latter I brought just in case I needed to defend myself from this animal. I set the camera up on a stand right outside the tent, pointed towards the woods, before crawling into my tent, zipping the door shut, and falling asleep. The next morning I felt a breeze coming from the front of the tent. I sat up and nearly had a heart attack when I saw that there was a gigantic hole torn in the tent door. I peeked out of the hole and noticed the chewed up carcass of a turkey lying in front of the tent, along with large paw prints surrounding it. He was here. I thought. I wanted to be excited, but I was mainly terrified. I had been extremely close to being this animal's dinner. The animal had torn open my tent, then for whatever reason, decided I wasn't worthy of a meal. Maybe the videotape will explain everything. I hooked the camera up to my computer and uploaded it, before examining the footage. At the very beginning of the video I saw myself setting the camera up, before stepping out of view to get into the tent. The next hour of footage was unfortunately corrupted for whatever reason, so I skipped ahead another few hours. At approximately 3 a.m. I saw a big furry wolf-like creature walk out of the woods, its eyes shining brightly in the dark. It was carrying the same dead turkey from before in its jaws. The creature then walked over to the tent, dropped the turkey to the ground and reared up on its hind legs like a bear. I felt chills run through my skeleton as the animal leaned forward and disappeared completely from the camera. Not only had it torn open my tent, but it had crawled into the tent with me as I was sleeping. I held my breath, desperately waiting for the animal to come crawling out of my tent and run back to the woods where it came. But it never did. 
Instead, as the sun rose up over the backyard, I saw myself climb out through the hole in the tent, walk over to the camera, and shut it off. After the footage was over, I felt anxious and confused. Even though that shot of it entering the tent was out of view of the camera, I'd expect to see some sort of movement from its paws as it tore the tent open. It was as if the opening in the tent was already there when it entered the yard. Had it torn the tent open in the corrupted footage? Also, if it had slept with me in the tent the entire night, how come it wasn't there when I woke up? The footage should have shown it going through the opening and it's not like there was any other way of leaving the tent. Then it hit me. I suddenly remembered all those mornings where I would wake up with dirty hands and feet for no explainable reason. And those mornings where my breath would smell worse than usual, as if I had devoured a whole bunch of rotting meat as a midnight snack. My heart sank. The entire room began to swirl around me as I struggled to stand. All of the pieces were falling into place. Why the creature only appeared at night, while I was sleeping. Why I was the only one in town who had never seen the thing. Why the camera had caught it entering the tent but not leaving. It turns out the camera had caught the creature leaving the tent. And that creature was the one who set up the camera in the first place. I had everything I needed. Pistol with silver bullets, silver blade, the only thing that could kill the beast. Sturdy pickup truck that could follow it through the mud if necessary. Adequate food and water that could last me for days. I wanted to kill this thing so badly I could feel the rage pumping through my veins, corrupting my blood and sending me into a near frenzy. It ripped my father in half right in front of me, remorselessly, with an apparent bloodlust that I'm still trying to process. I lived alone with my father for a few years, taking care of him, helping him do basic things because he had become decrepit in the last several years. We lived in a small shack on the edge of nothing, a bleak and dense wilderness. He often told me stories of the wilderness of those that went in and never came back out, or if they did, they were forever changed. Many nights I would sit on the back porch, sipping beer and staring out at the thick line of trees. My father and I would go hunting in those woods but only so far. We could always see the cabin from our stomping grounds. In a weird way, I developed the belief that as long as we were in the shack's sight, that it would protect us. Which, of course, was shattered when my father got brutally murdered in front of me that night. I probably would have been a goner too, except in my desperation and terror. I picked up the Bible and held it in front of my chest. The werewolf howled and its fist froze an inch from the book and promptly pulled back. It then sat on its haunches and whined like a puppy. For a brief second, my gaze turned incredulously to the book, and when I glanced back up again, the beast had gone. I wept for my father, and when the tears were spent, I buried him in the backyard. After my grief somewhat subsided, I collected my thoughts and a new goal formed in my head, that of vengeance. I'd often sit on the back porch and stare at the Bible, thinking about how it saved my life that night. And then I remembered what the priest said happened to his wife many years back. I couldn't believe I didn't think about it before now. I did hesitate, but my dad had been religious, at least vaguely, and had a sort of tenuous friendship with Father George at one point. So I made the trip. About half a mile down the road, the decent-sized house sat right at the end, seeming like a damn thing. I remembered the whispers around town, that the priest veered from his faith, and that was why his wife had died. I took a few deep breaths and got out of the car walking up the gravel road and knocking on the door. The day was fine enough, a bit overcast and just a little chilly, but okay. I stared out at the priest's acres and felt a sense of peace, my very first slice of it since my father died. Father George opened the door and smiled and not the fake kind of smile my father and I had been given because we were poor. He just saw us as members of his flock. I wasn't necessarily a religious man, but I admired his consistency if nothing else. I came into the living room and he asked if I wanted anything to drink. I said just a bottle of water would be fine if he had any. Once he emerged from the kitchen, he handed me the bottle of water and sat down. After an uncomfortable silence, which only lasted a couple of seconds, I spoke up. Father George, I won't lie, as I believe you'd frown on that kind of thing, but I came here for a reason. I know you always liked my father and I, and, well, something has happened to him. 
something similar to what happened to your wife. What you said happened. Father George cleared his throat, maintaining his silence for a few more seconds. Then he said, I try not to think about that night, but when I do, my heart is filled with a rage that I just can't let go. I am practically a feeble old man. I want to take vengeance on the beast that killed my wife. But two things are stopping me. I am a holy man. Secondly, as I said, physically, I do not think I am up to the task. I told him that I was. The same beast killed my father and would have done the same to me if I hadn't held the Bible in front of me. Father George paused. That is interesting. Since I was wearing something holy, it didn't occur to me that it could have been the reason I wasn't mauled by the beast. All of this seems to suggest that it is an instrument of holy vengeance, and my own sense of right and wrong pales in comparison. But it killed your wife, the woman you loved. Father George's eyes became moist and he looked away. I need your help, Father. You are the only other one who knows about the wolf, and honestly, I can't do this alone. I am not the only one, Father George said. There is one other. Her husband fell victim to it, or so she claims. But I do not know if you can trust the woman in the woods. Father George told me that a woman lived in the woods, not far from the main road. He told me he would consider what I said, but that I should leave for now so that he could collect his thoughts. I got up in my car and left. Even though he told me I couldn't trust the woman, nonetheless, I was compelled to seek her out. I parked my car near the shack my father and I built with my own hands. Then, I went behind the shack and entered the woods. I could have just parked my truck anywhere on the side of the gravel road, but I didn't want anyone in town, especially Father George, to see me entering and exploring the woods. He, above all us, would know what I was up to. I believe Father George was being authentic and telling how things were from his perspective, but being a priest and everything, his view was restricted to what he currently believed. I had to travel my own path. The woman's tent didn't take long to find, not really. I probably hiked for about a mile all total, combing the woods back and forth until I saw it. My heart skipped a beat as I realized this was the farthest I had ever been into the wilderness. An elderly woman was hanging her clothes on a line, the ends of the line supported by two trees directly opposite each other. The tent looked small, but I spotted a luxurious rug inside, a wooden chair and desk, and smaller items that I thought might have been talismans or something. The old woman saw me. Her eyes grew big and she made to flee. I held up my hands, backing off a little. I just want to talk about your husband, I said. She halted in her tracks. Who told you about that? I hesitated. The priest who lives in town. The woman spat on the ground. That bastard has been spreading rumors about me for years. Well, I haven't heard them. She hesitated for several moments, then offered me to come into her tent and hear the real side of the story, as she put it. The woman introduced herself as Bethany. She said she and her husband had run a small business in town years and years ago, and based on the dates, it happened before I was born. After I said what had happened in the shack on that fateful, horrific day, she told a similar story to mine, and to Father George's, about how the werewolf broke into the place and slaughtered him right there. Bethany said it was the most traumatic experience of her life, and Father George painted her a liar. No one could corroborate her story, of course, but charges weren't brought. It explained why she fled the town and decided to live in the woods. The town had shamed her. I wasn't sure why I never heard the stories, or maybe my dad did and just didn't tell me. I would have thought one of the other people in town would have told me, but maybe she was the town's dirty secret. Or maybe they were afraid of her. If you don't believe me, Bethany said, go to the only abandoned building in town. It used to be a dry cleaning service. I do not go inside the buildings anymore because the werewolf only kills inside buildings. It cannot kill you in front of anything you have built with your own two hands, but inside, it has domain. Father George has no doubt told you he thinks the beast is an instrument of holy vengeance, and I believe that's true. This is a weakness of it, however, and for reasons that are unknown to me. Bethany said she wouldn't talk to me further until I had checked out the old one-story building. I remember passing it hundreds of times during my lifetime, never giving it much thought, except how creepy it looked. The door to the building opened easily, 
Large chunks of wood were missing where the doorknob should have been. Clearly, people had broken into it over the years. I opened the door and went inside. Everything was dark, and I turned on my flashlight, always kept several in the car, something my dad taught me when I was younger. You do not want to be stranded somewhere, in a strange place, completely in the dark. I shone the bright beam all over the large room near the desk, scanning the rows of empty racks. I didn't see anything of interest at first. Then someone's ghost materialized in front of me, and I let out a scream, almost dropping the flashlight and I was trembling too severely to move or flee. Bethany never should have cursed the beast, it said. I know she did it to avenge my death, but it's only brought pain to her. The ghost's voice was wispy. I could barely hear it, but the whispers sent violent shivers down my spine. The man had clearly been killed in a grisly way, similar to my dad, and I tried to avoid looking at the ghastly wounds. It remained for several seconds before wavering and disappearing. As soon as the trembles ceased, and I knew the ghost had gone, I fled the building. I hurriedly opened the truck door, fumbled putting the key in the ignition, finally turning it. I took the car out of park and peeled the hell out of there. I had unfinished business with the woman in the woods. Based on what the ghost of her husband said, it stood to reason that she was responsible for the wolf creature killing my father. After all, it seemed that her cursing the beast resulted in something horrible happening. The ghost disappeared before I could find out what. On the other hand, the woman cursed the wolf creature to avenge the death of her husband. So it killed before that. Bethany was still putting her clothes on the line when I came to her little clearing. A pang of sympathy momentarily sliced through me. I was still angry at the prospect that she was responsible for the beast killing my father, but I didn't see it as deliberately murderous, more like blind fury. I met your husband a little while ago, I said. His ghost. You didn't tell me I'd meet a fucking ghost, I said. <laughs> I can still see the terror in your eyes. You are telling me the truth, Bethany said. He told me that you cursed the beast to take revenge. My husband was a kind man, but only told you part of the story. For some reason, I felt as if his ghost gave me the power to curse the beast, to channel its killing urge to annihilating those that lack faith. Because my study of the occult has led me to believe that the priest is responsible, albeit indirectly, for the origin of the wolf. It came to be because he had faith, then abandoned it. After the death of my husband and its transformation by my hand, the werewolf seems to seek the same in its victims. But, but his wife, out I started. She died, yet he survived. You said that it seeks out those that are like him. He should have died. You mentioned the werewolf didn't attack you when you held the Bible. If Father George was dressed as a priest in that moment, he would have been spared. I found this strange. Sure, it explained why he had been spared that one time, but not all the other times after he could have killed. It didn't seem possible that he'd be dressed like a priest 24-7 or carrying a Bible. There had to be a better explanation. Honestly, I didn't know what to think. This werewolf seemed equal parts mystery and horror. I realized I couldn't rely on the perceptions of Bethany or the Father George. I needed time to think. I knew that each second that passed would give the werewolf another opportunity to kill me. I figured that as long as I held a Bible in my hands, I'd be safe. So much had happened that I couldn't even think straight. That was as much of a danger, if not a higher one, than giving the beast more time to annihilate me. Driving back to my shack, I noticed how deep the night had settled into everything, pervading every crevice my eyes could see, and all the hidden ones that people probably wished would just go away. Back at the shack, I sat on the wooden chair and leaned over the desk. I lit the lamp on the desk a few moments before, and a soft glow filled the room. I realized I hadn't gone through the trunk since Dad died, and that I probably should. I opened the trunk, seeing all the possessions he had accumulated over the years. Most of it was loose leaf papers or small leather-bound journals. I did my best to go through them all, making sure to keep the Bible close for protection. Once I had read most of the journals and papers, I just sat there incredulous. My dad had known the wolf, had conversations with it. I remembered he told stories of those who went deep into the woods and never came out, but apparently he was one of the lucky souls who did and lived to tell the tale. My mind returned to the question 
of why the werewolf had spared the woman in the woods and the priest while killing the priest's wife and the woman's husband. My rage at wanting the thing dead dissolved into an intense curiosity and then spiked into a constant state of low terror. I hadn't been very deep into the woods. My father had built a kind of vague mysticism around it. The thing he had used to instill such a feeling of terror in me was something I knew I needed to chase after despite my fear. <laughs> the woman believed that the werewolf killed her husband for reasons unknown to her and killed the priest's wife because of its lack of faith after she transformed it, channeled it, as she claimed. But Father George had been wearing holy garb equivalent to my Bible, so why had he been spared? She had even said the werewolf had been created from Father George's lack of faith, not just lack of faith, but having abandoned his faith. Of course the faith might have ebbed and flowed in the man, considering he was still a priest, but did the beast really make such distinctions? Underneath all the papers in the trunk was a secret panel. Inside lay a shining pistol. I checked to make sure it was still filled with silver bullets. It was. My father told me that if I ever needed to go into the woods, that I should take this pistol with me. But be warned, son. Despite what you might have read, you cannot kill the werewolf with a silver bullet. Only seriously wound it for a time. I grabbed the pistol and headed into the woods. The moon seemed suspended in a hammock of clouds, and I swallowed nervously. I know how werewolves are perceived, except my recent experience taught me that werewolves are real, and that they can be vicious killers waiting to pounce from the dark at any moment. As I went deeper into the woods, my fear increased. I could feel my blood pumping in my ears, and my left hand shook around the pistol. I didn't even know what I was looking for, but for some reason, I knew that if I went far enough into the woods, I'd find what I was looking for. Eventually, I came across a cave tucked behind a thick line of trees. I barely glimpsed it as I scanned the trees, but then my eyes went back to the blur of gray between the trees. If the werewolf was hiding anywhere, it would be inside, I told myself. I crept closer to the cave, pointing my flashlight closer to the ground so that I wouldn't arouse attention. I jumped several times while approaching the cave, but the sources of the sounds were only harmless critters. Once I was near the mouth of the cave, I had no choice but to shine my flashlight inside. I didn't see anything at first, so I had to venture further into the cave. The beam bounced all over the cavern walls, and I noticed deep scratch marks that upon closer inspection were tally marks. When the beam finally caught a patch of dark brown fur, which seemed to shudder with each long, beastly breath, I screamed. Two red eyes, sleepy and menacing, peered from the bubble of darkness. You are your father's son, I know you, the werewolf said. Stay back, I said, even though you savagely killed my father, I can't shoot you yet. It wouldn't even do any good because silver bullets can't kill you. I need to know, why did you kill my father? Father George's wife, the husband of the woman in the woods, the woman said that she cursed you to attack those that lack faith. Father George lacked faith, according to, that woman is a fool, she does not control me, although she thinks she does. The magic provided by her dead husband, the perfidious soul who deserves to languish, only increased my rage at those that are unfaithful. The pistol shook in my hands again. I tried to keep the beam steady, but it kept bouncing on the cavern walls. Wait, are you saying you annihilate those that have been unfaithful to their partners? The werewolf nodded and bared its teeth. What about my father? My mom died long ago. Are you saying he was with another woman? Your mother isn't dead. She still lives, but a thousand miles away. She thinks he is in the ground rotting, and you with him. He led a double life, and you in its shadow. Then the werewolf got on its legs, bared its teeth again, both red eyes radiating a murderous gleam. All of a sudden, the beast lunged. I fired the pistol. Two bullets landed in its chest, another in its right leg. It whimpered and fell to the ground. I emptied the remaining bullets into the beast, and its spasms seemed to roll together before it went entirely still. I cautiously approached the motionless body. Then what happened next, I'm not quite sure. The werewolf stirred, growled, and its claws barely missed my foot. A billowy cloud of smoke filled the cavern, first a deep and frightening black, then becoming white and ghostly. My feet and arms weren't my own until several minutes later. 
the white cloud surrounding me dissipated, not slowly, but suddenly. The ghost of Bethany's husband floated before me, looking as ghastly as ever. I remember my first posthumous visit to the werewolf. That horrid beast is filled with revelation, isn't he? I couldn't talk for several minutes. The terror needed time to loosen. Nanut, my mother was still alive. When I recovered my wits, he took me deeper into the woods, far enough from the cave that eventually I stopped looking over my shoulder. Bethany's husband led me to a great pine tree, which seemed taller than the others. At its base rested a small ornate box. A bejeweled blade rested inside, the only thing that could kill the beast, according to the ghost. Shortly after, I embarked on the mission to remove the werewolf from this town I lived in most of my life, but I soon found that it wasn't easy to stalk and kill. It always seemed to be one step ahead of me. With the ghost's help, I tracked it to a gas station in the middle of nowhere, an abandoned one at that. I finally thought I had cornered the thing. Part of me didn't want to extinguish it for good because it had known about my mother. It knew about my dad's secrets, that he uprooted me from my childhood home that I didn't even remember, and placed me in this strange isolated town, where my life had been reduced to hunting a werewolf that, as far as I was concerned, knew the deepest, darkest secrets of the universe. It doesn't matter where I'm employed as a park ranger. What does matter is my secret job, the thing that I do when I'm off the grid, so to speak. A werewolf started appearing about six months ago, and I'm still not sure why. At first, we got calls from visitors saying they encountered grizzly bears, or something approximating one, deep in the forest. For the first few months, we got maybe a dozen calls. After that, things really started to ramp up, daily, or rather, nightly, sightings. Despite that, no one could really get a good look at the thing everyone assumed to be beer. Then my boss showed up, a man I rarely saw. He tossed a trank dart gun at me and told me to head into the woods. Whatever you do, don't kill the thing. Based off the information we've been able to gather, this is no damn bear. Something possibly supernatural. Does this have anything to do with Elijah's disappearance last month? Something killed Elijah, and we never found the body. James only gave a slight nod, something that could be denied later if asked. The less you know, the better, Liam. Just take your truck and head into the woods. I'll mark the most recent sighting on your map, James said, crossing his arms and giving me a look that told me not to ask any more questions, but I couldn't help myself. Guess some weird government agency is involved in this if you're telling me not to kill it. You'd think the safety of the visitors would come first, I said, but James cut me off. Now officially, that's none of our business, Liam. Just taking orders. You'd be wise to do the same. So I closed my mouth and got to work loading my vehicle with some last-minute things I thought I might need. Food, water, binoculars. Then I got in the truck and drove down the winding road. I decided to not get on the walkie because I didn't want to alert James. My plan was this. Pick up Bill, my partner in crime more or less, at his usual patrolling location. Then head off to where the location James marked on the map and see if we couldn't tag team this thing. I caught Bill just sitting in his patrol truck, reading an Agatha Christie novel and smoking a cigarette. I remember him telling me how relaxing he found it. Being out here, not a care in the world, tending to his biological needs, the cigarette, and the needs of his higher brain, the Agatha Christie novel. Hey Bill, we got a situation James wants us to look into. Bill looked up from his novel, mildly irritated. What kind of situation? <laughs> Gotta trank something, you know, that thing that everyone thinks is a bear, but probably isn't. Why trank instead of kill? <laughs> yeah, I was wondering that too, anyway. Hop in, good buddy. We got a long night ahead of us, and that's putting it really fucking mildly. Bill got in, and we drove off in the direction of the last sighting. I filled Bill in on what little I knew. Guess the thing that really concerns me is why now, why a month after Elijah's death? Bill asked, thumbing through the book in his hands, but not really reading it. That caught my attention too. I don't know the reason, I just know that something fishy is going on. Then that's when we saw it. A large, hairy beast running on all fours, then randomly standing upright and roaring. Our headlights seemed to confuse the thing. Bill took out his pistol, rolled down the window and fired. 
Bill, what the fuck are you doing? No lethal force is allowed on this thing. We gotta use the Trank Gun. The thing, which upon closer inspection looked exactly like a werewolf, just roared and charged at the truck, grabbing its bottom and shaking it violently until Bill and I were completely disoriented. It then leapt into the trees. What the fuck is wrong with you? I said to Bill again once my head stopped spinning. I said no lethal weapons. Sorry Liam, just got rattled is all, wasn't going to get turned to human paste because a pair of government issue sunglasses told us not to us actual bullets. Bill replied, face flushed. Well after that I began to drive again keeping our eyes peeled for the werewolf. We heard howls coming from the infinite line of trees to our left. No matter how much we combed the woods, we didn't find anything. This went on for several nights experiencing horrific sightings of the massive man-wolf. I went by myself after the first night because I didn't trust Bill not to fire bullets at the thing. James was ripping me a new ass because I couldn't track the damn thing down at least, not keep it in my sights long enough to trank it. On the fourth night, I sat in my truck on the side of a wide road, scanning the eerily still line of palm trees. My ears pricked as I heard the soft crunch of twigs as tired crushed them. I peeked in the rearview mirror and saw a sleek black car parking behind me. A short woman with red hair came out of the car, using precise movements so that not one ounce of energy was wasted. Are you Liam? The woman asked, popping into my window like she was a cop about to give me a ticket. I heard the trees rustle behind her and began to perspire a little on my forehead. I'd tell you that you shouldn't be out this way, ma'am, since we've seen had a few bear sightings out this way, but I started. I don't mean to be blunt, but I outrank park rangers, again, not trying to be a jerk, just stating a fact. The woman seemed fairly young and her smile sent a shiver down my spine because it was so emotionless. She explained to me what was going on. She worked for a government agency, one I hadn't heard before, and they had been working on a serum to reverse the transformation of the werewolf. They were hoping I could sedate the thing before it did any real damage or chose to move on to an even broader wilderness. There has been a reason why this werewolf has been so good at evading you, and I'm not sure it has anything to do with it having preternatural abilities, the woman said. She finally introduced herself as Sarah Perkins. Here, take this trank gun. It comes with a special tranquilizer that will not only sedate the werewolf, but also hopefully reverse his transformation. It hasn't been tested on his kind, since we believe he is the only one of his kind that exists. Sarah said and handed me a much larger gun than I had, which had a small tube filled with yellow liquid fitted onto the top. She had one for herself too. We hurried into the woods following the howls until I felt like we were dangerously close. Sarah scanned the environment, looking more vigilant than nervous. Okay, maybe a little nervous, but she hit it remarkably well. As for me, I was terrified, not afraid to admit that since I didn't have special government training to deal with a friggin' werewolf. The trees all around us began to rustle and before I could really get my bearings, the massive hairy beast shot from the top of one of the trees and landed on the ground. My hands shook. I tried to steady my gun, except my nerves wouldn't let me. Steady, I said I'd steady, but I just couldn't calm my shaking hands. The beast slowly moved closer on all fours, fierce yellow eyes fixed on me. A pound of drool must have escaped from its jaws hanging from them in thick, disgusting streams that made me want to vomit. It swiped the air with massive claws, growling. Just as I thought I was a goner, I heard the sound of a whisper whizzing by at about a hundred miles an hour, landing in the beast's hairy, bulging neck. Without thinking, I fired my own gun. The dart landed in the thing's abdomen. It growled weakly and collapsed onto the ground. Sarah didn't waste any time. She ran toward the thing and placed a small chip deep into the fur of its right arm. Tracking device, she said as its breathing slowed. The trank transformation dart did what she claimed. The beast began to shrink. The fur started to go back into the skin. It all happened so quickly that at first I didn't believe what I was seeing. I went over to the man who shivered and rubbed his arms. The transformation had taken a toll on him. It took me a minute, but I recognized the man. Elijah, I said under my breath, you're alive, how is this even possible? Well, congratulations, Sarah, a man's voice said from behind. You got to Subject X first. You won the bet. 
I turned around. Bill. Bill, what is going on? I asked, tone clearly frazzled. Sarah jumped in. We work at the same agency, we had a little bet going. Whoever got to the werewolf first could do with it as it pleased. Kill it, or trank it, and but a tracking device on it. Of course my way aligned with the agencies. Bill here is a renegade wants to eliminate everything in sight. Bill gave a soft chuckle. Well guess I got what I want either way, Bill said, grinning and patting me on the back as he walked past me. He knelt in front of Elijah and seemed to pluck one of the remaining werewolf hairs from one of its forearms and put it in a small glass vial. Then Sarah and Bill seemed to be talking in code and I couldn't at all parse what they were saying. Bill came up to me afterward. Okay, Liam, we better get out of here before that trank dart wears off. Looks like the serum's effects were only temporary. It'll completely change back into werewolf form in less than 15 minutes. Part of the transformation has already begun. The sedative will wear off in about 10 after that. But don't worry, we can track the thing with the device Sarah put on it. So we all left. Sarah in her sleek government vehicle and Bill and I in our park ranger truck. You can't tell James that I work for a government agency that hunts a werewolf, he said. Now, I wanted to kill the thing, wipe it off the map, but Sarah had other plans. I have to respect the bet. I lost. She won. Which means that Elijah will be roaming the woods and we have to track him every night, study him. After a while, once the agency has all the information it needs, it will either give a kill order and I can deliver a bullet to the thing's brain, or it will come up with a serum that will permanently erase Elijah's werewolf tendencies. So with Bill's help, I track Elijah every night, using regular trank darts to sedate him. We take hair and skin samples, put everything into stainless steel containers that get shipped back to a secret government lab. They are working on a serum, just like Bill said, one which will be permanent. I have learned to accept Bill's new identity, aspiring werewolf killer. I'll deal with it when the time comes. I think I have additional problems to the fate of Elijah because I've gone to the workman's cabin. Seeing Bill with those strange yellow eyes more than once, I'm not sure if he's a full-fledged werewolf because he's been with me every night, and I just see him in his human form, except sometimes as we are driving along, I'll see his eyes turn yellow under the deep shadows cast by the moon. Something is clearly different. Did the sample he took from Elijah that night have something to do with it? I feel trapped in this situation. Bill seems something else besides human, and I can't abandon my post without making him suspicious. I also don't want to abandon my post, because I feel like I have a duty to the visitors here to keep this werewolf at bay. And I do agree with Sarah given the circumstances. I don't feel comfortable ending the life of a fellow park ranger. Bill's a relative newcomer, and I worked with Elijah for years before he disappeared. I don't want to give up on a fellow ranger. I... Let's see, Rick said, eyes on the highway. I paid really scary people a $500 deposit to find the werewolf that killed my sister. He lifted a finger from the wheel, counting. If the Coterie Witches actually find you, I owe them another $1,500. More fingers raised. My car's half wrecked and I'm not going to tell my insurance I tried to kill a seven-foot werewolf by crashing into a bridge. And the werewolf's my best friend, but he can only transform by bawling like a baby, which he's too mean to do. He shook his head. How did my life get so screwed up? Count your blessings, I said. Forget the 1500. Once the Coterie figure out you and I know each other, they'll just kill you. And at least your best friend isn't a whiny drama queen. Bite me, wolf boy. Anyway, who's the queen here? The banter didn't fool me. Rick Ames was a badly disoriented fellow. Four years ago, his sister Ginger died when a werewolf sparked a panic in Drunken Tree's Square Diner. Tonight, he'd learned who the werewolf was. Now he was trying to absorb it all as we drove south toward Argenta. He was only two years younger than me, but I'd had four years to adjust to what had happened, what had been done to me. But he was making a tremendous effort and not just to be tough. He'd never dared a gay joke around me before either. I'll watch out for him, Ginger. So what can we do now, he asked. First thing, I said, you've got to call off the coterie even if they keep the 500. I suppressed a shudder. You don't want anything to do with them. 
I don't know how to get a hold of them. I'd have to call Mr. White. Then do it. It's almost 10 o'clock at night. Risk it. Tell you what, Rick said. We're only six or eight minutes from the Burger King in the pits. We can eat, and I can call from there. We rode in silence for a mile or so. So tell me about it, he said at last. What really happened to you? He meant four years ago before Ginger was killed. You know I was missing for a month. Here's how I remember it. I was at home, that apartment on Wisteria. It was June 13th, Saturday. I remember eating lunch, getting on Facebook, and then dreams, vague things. Ever have one of those nights when you keep waking up and having little dreams, and the night seems to last twice as long as it oughta? Yeah, I hate those. Like that only three or four times longer. Then there was a guy yelling at me and I opened my eyes and it was bright as hell. I wasn't in my apartment. I was hung up on the wrong side of a barbed wire fence and this guy's yelling at me to get off his land. He thinks I'm drunk. I think I'm still dreaming it cause nothing around me looks familiar. He's calling the sheriff's office and I realize I don't know the clothes I'm wearing. They're all ragged, half worn out. Jesus. Yeah, so I start unsnagging my clothes and ask him where the hell I am. Turns out I'm on a county road south of 88. I'm 15 miles from town. I reach for my phone and I don't have it. We never found it. GPS tracking didn't find it. Ginger told me your folks were going nuts. Yeah, well a deputy showed up about the time I got loose and got to the road. About then I'm figuring out I don't have any underwear. Just jeans and a t-shirt and cheap sneakers. The deputy takes a look at me and kinda rares back. Then he asks hostile like, what's your name? Rick laughed. I can just hear boy on at the end of that. Yeah, I could too. I tell him my name and he looks like he can't decide whether to cuff me or pray over me. Where you been? He asks. And this time he does say, boy? I tell him. Last thing I knew I was in my apartment. But I scratch an itch on my arm and now I'm staring at my arms cause they're too thin. I was remembering too well. I choked back the rising fear. Now I get scared and I ask him what's going on. He says I've been missing and it's July 22nd. I'm so scared I ask him what year. He tells me it's still 2015 and I about cried. You? Rick scoffed. You don't get how weird it was. I didn't notice for a while, but the deputy sure did. I didn't have a beard. I'd been gone 39 days and I had one, maybe two days growth of whiskers. That's all. In fact, I had about exactly what I'd have had on June 13th, and there was something else. The bulletin on me mentioned the scars on my chin and cheek, said they were very distinct. But when I woke up in the barbed wire, they were gone. No scars anywhere. Not the burn scar on my arm, no vaccination scars, and I don't have a single mole anymore. Rick knew most of the aftermath already. Nobody accused me of anything, but nobody believed I remembered nothing of those 39 days. My parents had paid a month's rent on my apartment, had made Facebook pages and what all about me, and now I just popped up in strange clothes saying I don't know. They saw my face scars were gone and thought I'd gone to Mexico for plastic surgery. That's really dangerous, mom said. My billfold phone and the clothes I'd been wearing were all gone. Aside from spoiled food, my apartment looked untouched. My keys were on their usual hook in the kitchen. My car's odometer hadn't changed. My boss looked at me slantwise, but he gave me my job back. My parents called as often as ever, and we still ate together on Sunday, but it was more formal than before, like right after I'd come out as gay. Nobody believed me except Ginger. I went to work, moved pallets all day, came home. I didn't talk to anybody but Ginger. I'd never been lower in my life. One night I called mom and it was like talking to that deputy again. Lock him up or pray over him. After I hung up, sitting on my couch, I broke down. And that was the first time I changed and it didn't hurt but it felt wrong the way water in your ear feels wrong, or a muscle that won't stop twitching. I could hear my skull bones creaking and stretching. My hands looked weird, palms too big, fingers too short. My vision blurred, then sharpened. I stood up to find a mirror and hit my head on a door lintel. The floor, the furniture, were too far below me. I got dizzy. Grabbing for the doorframe, I punched claws through the sheetrock wall. I pulled my claws in, pushed them out again. Watching that, I wanted to throw up. I was scared and muddled, but not a beast. I still had a human mind. I hid all that day. I fell asleep curled on the living room floor and woke up normal. 
I almost convinced myself it was a nightmare until I found the claw marks by the hall door. I nearly called in sick to work the next day, scared to death it would happen again. For two weeks I was tight as a drumhead, jumping at every sound, watching everyone watch me. I studied the moon phases until I figured out they meant nothing for me. I drank a hell of a lot more than was smart. Occasionally I drank myself to a weepy stage, something I never did around other people, and found myself changing again. I learned finally that sadness triggered the change and the calm reversed it. It wasn't enough to control my emotions, I had to let go of them, become empty of them. Damn tough for someone who spent his whole life holding everything inside. I'd always held everything in and now I held even tighter, but I had to talk to somebody. Ginger Ames was the only person in the world I trusted. I was afraid to have her in my apartment. Of course I thought werewolf when I began to change and I was afraid of the horror movie ideas. If Ginger was there when I changed, I'd go mad with hunger and eat her. Since I'm so uptight, I thought my control would be stronger in a public place. I asked her to meet me at the square diner. It's the worst mistake I ever made, I told Rick. His grip on the wheel was white knuckled. Every goddamn day I blame myself that she's dead. You... His voice caught, came out husky. You shouldn't blame yourself. You didn't do this to yourself. I didn't handle it too well, Sikars. He turned into the Burger King on 88, let's get fed. We kept quiet until we had a table to ourselves. Time for you to make a call? I said. You sure it can't wait till tomorrow? But he pulled out his phone and dialed. Hello, sir, it's Richard Ames. I'm sorry for calling so late. They are? That's good. No, sir, I didn't think you would. Not this quickly. He bit his lip. The thing is, sir, I don't want the co- Your, um, associates to investigate after all. Yes, sir, I'm sorry. And I understand if I can't get my deposit back. You will? That would be great. But you see, I've been well advised not to look for the guy that I just make trouble. He listened, then gave me a nod. Yes, sir, that's fine. I'll be up, thanks. He hung up. He's gonna call. He says they might give my deposit back. Did you pay cash? Cashier's check. Look, Travis, is the coterie are. Are they really that dangerous? You know what they are. Yeah. yeah, I know witchcraft's real, but I never heard they were organized. There's at least two groups around the lake. I think they compete, and there's more than one level to the coterie. There's some decent folks that don't know about things like me. How'd you get onto the coterie anyway? Mr. White said they're a secret. They are mostly, I have found them sooner, but Ginger died and I spent four years hunting that guy. It's only lately I've started asking about myself. Remember the clothes I woke up in? Old, worn out? It's a freak thing, but I knew the t-shirt, I recognized it, it used to be Ben Poundstone's. Do you remember the hand-painted t-shirts Ben and Charity used to wear to school? He swallowed a bite of Whopper too fast. I remember hers, a size too small. They came from a place in Branson, custom airbrush. Ben's had a black unicorn, emerald horn. I shrugged. That's what I woke up wearing in July. So I asked Ben. He said his mom donated a bunch of old clothes to the help closet. So the Coterie bought old clothes for you? <laughs> no, you didn't see how worn out these were. Charities just tossed donated clothes that old. It had to be somebody working at the closet. I started checking out people behind the closet and the name Coterie started coming up. Elaine Poundstone's almost certainly one of them. I was waiting for her when I saw you today. Laney Poundstone? Geez, she used to chaperone our band trips. <laughs> yeah, like I said, there are two levels and his phone cut me off. Rick paled, but he answered quickly. Yes, sir, I saw him mouth bullshit. Yes, sir, I could be there tonight. No, that's not too late. Thanks. He closed the call. That girl Kite is up in Drunken Tree, he says. She still got my check. He says to meet her at the diner, but not till after 11. It closed at 10, didn't it? Except Fridays and Saturdays, it's a trap, right? Oh, hell yeah, she could bring it to you any time. No need to go get it tonight. He grinned. So help me, he was enjoying this. So they figured out we're friends. <laughs> yeah, so now you're a problem. This was going to be hard. That's why you're not going. He did not take that well. Look, I said. They made me for some purpose, but you're just a headache. I'm useful to them, but you're not. 
so you're keeping your distance. I didn't really persuade him so much as convince him I wouldn't budge, and we didn't have time to argue. Take me home, I said. I'll take your car. If I need help, I'll call. You can use my car. And you'll keep me posted. I assured him I would. We linked friend tracking on our phones. By the time I thought of using it, it was too late. 20 minutes later, I was crossing Grace Mountain. We'd tried to think of preparations, things I could bring, but neither of us owned a gun or a knife bigger than a scout pocket knife. Neither of us had a Bible handy or crucifix or holy relic or piece of the true cross. I didn't like that they'd given Rick time to prepare. Rushing him would have been good strategy. It scared me they didn't think they needed that extra advantage. I planned to park some ways off, approaching the diner on foot a few minutes before 11. I hoped to ambush whoever the coterie sent. Even in human shape, they'd improved my night vision, and I seemed to move more quietly. It didn't matter, the coterie were too far ahead of us. I drove past the darkened diner without stopping. No cars in the gravel lot. If anybody lurked nearby, I couldn't see them. They'd see Rick's car, hopefully assume he was driving. I stopped a block up a side street. Slinking through yards, I zigzagged toward the square diner. The moon hadn't risen yet, but with my improved night vision, I saw two figures in the shadows behind the diner more than a block away. I could even see that one of them had a phone out, the screen lit. I wish I'd known what that phone meant. I'd argued with myself whether to change. I'd decided to stay human until I was done sneaking through yards. Now it was time to cry. It's not easy to be sad when you're scared blind. I thought about Ginger, all we'd lost, how my parents had grown formal, about Rick's pain, about the last four years of loneliness. I felt the first sting of tears. Ginger, I said under my breath, I want to take care of him. You're doing just great. For a heart-stopping moment, it was Ginger's husky voice. I whirled. A slight female figure stood a foot behind me, and I hadn't heard a thing. She held a phone. I've got the dog, she told it. Where's the puppy? She also held a knife, long and straight, a by-god dagger. It glinted in the orange sodium lights, as if the blade were gold. So did her hair, a pale orange cloud. Kite, from Rick's description. It doesn't take silver to hurt me. I watched that knife like a cat watching a broom. With the blade, she gestured toward the shadowed pair. After you. If I could have changed, I might have taken her but her ambush had goosed me back into stark fear. For the moment, I was stuck as human. Sure, I said, my voice still easy and calm. I was caught, whether I waited here or over there as we approached one of the others called, he's on his way, in a high, thin voice. He looked about 45 or 50, short dark hair peppered with gray. Then I recognized the tall, slender woman beside him, Fern Ames, Rick and Ginger's mother, what the hell was she doing here? Good God, was Fern Ames part of the coterie? Then she saw me, her voice dead, she said, you, I should have known, you've been nothing but trouble. Douglas, Ginger's dad, had been reasonable, but Fern had never stopped blaming me somehow for Ginger being gay. He's about three miles out, the man said. Rick, what did you do, make a spell to call him here? Fern wore a long khaki coat I recognized. It hung open and I realized she wore a robe beneath it. I think, Fern said, and stopped. I had never seen a face so empty. I think Doug's dead. We swayed on my feet, shocked to my soul. The man spoke, his thin voice ironic. Our acquisiting of the mother did not go as smooth as we hoped. He shrugged. Is the boy driving your car? Maybe you'll be blamed for it. Now I felt grief, but it was swallowed, utterly engulfed by cold rage. Why, I said, voice too flat to make it a question. What did we ever do to you? I heard Kite giggle. Rick was right, she was hella scary. The man shrugged again. Nothing, you were handy. Handy? What, you thought we wanted you for something? We had to bleed off some mojo. Sheer mystification was piercing my anger. What, you had too much good karma? You had to do something evil? He laughed. All that good evil crap about balancing magic is, you know, crap. He glanced at the phone. Ever overheated your brakies on a hill? What do you do when your brakes fail? 
Never been that stupid, but my mom taught me hit something soft. That's good. Well, sometimes magic's like a car with bad brakes. You get momentum and lose control. Summer of 2015, things between us and the circle got pretty hot. You could say we were fighting for the wheel and heading for a wreck. Shannon said we had to shed some momentum diverted into something random. He shrugged. You were nothing but a nice, thick hedge. Something soft, Kite said, smiling broadly. We didn't even pick you, really, the man added. Your building was in a hot spot, and you were home. He made a zap gesture. Tough luck, he said, so I attacked him. And nothing scientific, I just hit him as fast and as hard as I could. I knocked him back into the diner, putting me out of Kite's immediate reach. His fists came up, but no more skillfully than mine. I popped him once in the throat, butted him in the mouth, kicked him hard in the crotch. He dropped the phone, thumped a fist into me a couple of times, then curled up, choking. I ran for the road. Catch Rick. Make him nope his ass out of here. I'll kill her, Kite shouted. I'd already made up my mind. With a choice between Fern and Rick, I'd save my friend. Somebody said a word. It was a simple sound, something like tan, but it rang all around me. A deep male voice. The ground quivered with it. It hit me in the chest like a cannon blast. I sprawled on the gravel, sliding to the road's edge. My muscles turned to string. The word, whatever it was, stole my strength. The new attacker killed my hope. I was beaten, almost before I'd started. Despairing, hardly knowing I was doing it, I began to weep. I saw headlights down Shore Road. A pickup, not Rick. That deep voice spoke again. A different word. K.O. The headlights blurred. The pickup cruised past, inches from my outstretched hand, without swerving or slowing. A spell to hide me. I flexed that hand, saw claws slide from my blunted fingers. I heard a familiar engine. My car was coming fast. Rick and I pushed myself to hands and knees. The ground was a mile below. I stood and heard a gasp behind me. Oh shit, the man rasped. Kite, he's turned. I wheeled around. Kite was coming at me, dagger ready. Behind her, the man dragged Fern across the diner's front. To my altered vision, distant streetlights lit the area like sunlight. Tan boomed around me again, but I wasn't weakened. In fact, it seemed to invigorate my altered body. Had they made a mistake at last? Kite was upon me. Christ, she's fast. I barely dodged her first swipe. Then we were circling each other. But the change made me fast too. It reshaped my joints for greater leverage and strength, lengthened my limbs for greater reach. I lunged and missed grabbing her wrist by a hair. She slashed my arm, but not deeply. Tires shrieked and headlights flared across us. We both flinched. I snatched at her and she sprang backward. Then she turned and ran for the diner's far end. With a glance back at the headlights, I pursued. The man stood beside Fern at the diner's entrance. The headlights swung across them. I hoped Rick recognized his mother's raincoat. No time, Kite screamed. Run! The man pushed Fern away, started Kite's way. K.O. said the deep ringing voice. For a moment, my vision blurred. Kite and the man disappeared. Fern seemed to shift sideways, some sort of illusion. Then my vision cleared and all three were back as they were but the headlights had centered upon Fern. My car passed me, engine roaring, then Rick rammed my car into the diner entrance, with his mother sandwiched between. Plate glass windows exploded into splinters. A section of concrete block wall shattered. The entrance roof collapsed. Fern had to be dead. They'd cast some sort of illusion, tricked Rick into killing his own mother. Oh, Ginger. I bore down on the two visible enemies. Kite darted toward the road. The man ran for the diner's rear. Kite was the more dangerous, so I went for him first. His foot slipped on a scatter of broken glass, and he went down hard. As I leaped toward him, I saw him hold up something like a red popsicle stick. He snapped it, and the huge voice said Tan again. I felt an incredible surge of strength, like I'd mainlined Red Bull. I leaped into the air so high I had time to think. This was dumb, but he didn't take the opening I'd left. In panic, he screamed and crossed his arms over his face. I landed crouched on his chest, feeling ribs break, driving ten claws into his soft belly. As I ripped at him, I saw several more wooden sticks colored red and green and yellow spill from his shirt pocket. So, no third man after all. 
They really were pop cycle sticks, or those things schools call craft sticks. Some kind of prepackaged spell, like a potion or amulet from an old story. I glanced back and Kite was racing toward me, nearly soundless on the gravel. Wondering how to aim, I snatched up a handful of sticks and snapped them all together. For lack of any better command, I growled, Get her! A cacophony of words boomed around us, Kite smacked into an invisible wall. I sprang toward her, staying low this time. If I jumped high, she wouldn't panic. She'd skewer me on the way down. She was slashing left and right blindly with the dagger. Had a word hidden me? I darted in. But in a moment of misguided chivalry, instead of tearing out her throat, I seized her wrist. Then by God, she knew where I was. The sticks had taken her strength, but not her speed. Faster than I could think, she popped the dagger from right hand to left, then slashed behind her back, taking me in the left ribs. Ripping down, she bounced the blade off my hip and laid fire along my thigh. The pain was stupefying. I clenched my fist, but then my head spun. I lost my hold and fell. She shrieked. My convulsive grip had crushed her wrist. Still blind to me, she slashed back and forth, knife in her left hand. One swing just above my head left floating hairs behind its screw chivalry. She was female and blinded by illusion and the deadliest enemy I'd ever faced. I ducked under a wild swing and ripped the inside of her thigh from crotch to knee. She screamed the harsh, rage-filled cry of a falcon. As she fell, I rolled away over and over. I, I rolled right into the man's body. I pushed, groaning to my hands and knees, blood pouring from my shirt and jeans. Is she coming again? She lay on the ground, both hands squeezing her leg. Blood gushed from between her fingers. I'd hit something big. I could see her grip weakening. I watched her eyes unfocus, her head fall back. Two popsicle sticks lay unbroken, one green, one yellow. I scooped them into my own pocket, then started crawling toward my crumpled car. Was Rick alive? I didn't make it. Flashing lights roused me from a faint, a drunken tree patrol car rounding the corner. Another approach down Pinter. The first cop twisted his spotlight back and forth across the scene. I heard him say, holy shit, then get on the radio, send medical, I've got at least three casualties. He went first toward my car. I snapped the green stick, concentrating hard. Pay, said the voice. I have no idea what it might have done. I snapped the yellow one. K.O. boomed around me, and with every ounce of mental strength remaining, I pictured Rick in the passenger seat. And it worked. Both cops and three paramedics reported finding Rick in the passenger side, buckled in, airbag in his lap. He was concussed, but not otherwise hurt. Fern was quite dead, bled out in moments, if not killed instantly. The Argenta police had already found Douglas dead on his front lawn, after neighbors called 911 about screams, fighting, and a car racing away. That took place almost exactly at 10, when Rick and I had been across town at the Burger King. I spun a confused tale about how these strangers had called Rick, saying they had his mother, I'd come along to help him. I showed the Burger King receipt. I claimed they'd had some sort of big cat on a leash that clawed them and ran away afterward. I said I'd been too busy fighting the girl with the knife to see how my car crashed. I denied knowledge of why any of it happened. The call record of Fern's phone by the dead man's body backed me up. So did the staff at Burger King, who amazingly remembered us. The dead man turned out to have a record for assault I had wounds from Kite's knife, and they couldn't identify Kite at all. Whatever story Rick told must not have contradicted mine too badly. I don't know what he knows about Fern's death. I've been afraid to ask. The cops don't like any of it, but they're taking my version, at least for now. They don't want to look for a werewolf. Rick tells me he's done. He's lost nearly his entire family. He's going to move to Atlanta, live with his brother while he finds a job. The Coterie can go to hell on their own time, he says. I'm glad he'll be with Gary, because to me he looks like a wounded animal searching for a place to die. But I'm not done, I have more names to check. Shannon, some sort of Coterie leader. Yuri White, who led Rick to Kite. The Circle, who might be allies against the Coterie, or might be worse. Ginger, I promise somebody is going to pay. We were always told not to venture out on Werewolf Road late at night when we were children. But one night, 
We were just too damn determined to know why the teenagers from our small town were so frightened by the unnerving place that we had to see for ourselves. I had my small backpack loaded with snacks, a flashlight with spare batteries, a flare gun with a can of bear spray, and attached to my backpack was my sleeping bag. The four of us gathered together behind my cousin's house, who lived just two houses down across the street, and together we all exchanged scary legends and stories we had heard about the road and the cemetery on it. I heard there's a woman in the trees who jumps on people's cars late at night. She sleeps on a mattress with her dead, rotting baby, Evan said with a morbid sense of pride in his voice. That's baloney, my cousin Justin said, shaking his head. I heard she was just drunk and that happened once. The baby wasn't dead. The police took it from her, though, he said in a matter-of-fact tone. You guys ever hear about the dead puppy in the box my brother found in the cemetery? I said aloud. The other three looked at me, their eyes widening with interest as I spoke up. He said he went up there alone one day around two years ago, when we moved here. He said he was walking through the graveyard, and near one of the tombstones, there was a purple box. He saw blood on the outside of the box and grabbed a stick to open it, and there was a dead puppy that someone sacrificed. He looked up and saw streamers in the trees, and an area where it looked like there was a fire. For four adolescent boys with active imaginations, you could only picture how terrified we were. There would have been next to no possibility that we would venture out anywhere such as that alone. But together it was a different story. We were all in this together despite how frightening it was. Oh come on, he's just jacking with you, Ronnie, the youngest of us four, spouted. I could tell if he was lying and believe me he wasn't. He had a look on his face that makes me feel like he wasn't. Are we going to do this or not? Justin said, seemingly irritated by the stories. We each shrugged and picked up our belongings, and next thing we knew, we were walking towards the woods that led to the legendary road on the other side. The leaves and sticks cracked beneath our feet as we stumbled around in the pitch black summer night. Justin had his flashlight shining ahead of our group. The narrow beam shone the heavy thicket that surrounded us. In some places you could see, even in the absence of light, the silhouettes of fast food litter like styrofoam cups of various sizes and plastic bottles or discarded cans that were scattered about. I felt the crunch of an empty beer can under my foot. I cursed under my breath as I realized just how loud and inconvenient my misstep was. Evan turned around and shushed me as we continued walking. Fuck off, Evan, I said in a stern but quiet voice. I raised my hand as he turned forward, the thought crossing my mind to smack the back of his head. I bit my bottom lip and considered how bad that could be for us if the wrong group of people noticed our presence. Okay, I can see the road. We need to decide right now if we are going to drop our stuff off first and then continue, or if we're going to take everything, Justin said. I looked around at the flat, dry ground that was covered in leaves nearby. That looks like a perfect area to set up camp, I said, pointing at the spot. We all four removed our bags as we walked over to the grounds I chose, setting them down. Anything valuable any of you might need to grab before we go? Justin asked. I ran to my bag and grabbed the bear spray, assuming it would be good just in case we ran into some trouble. Ronnie and Evan shook their heads and continued with him as he moved his flashlight from off our newly claimed campsite and headed for the cemetery on Werewolf Road. I quickly caught up to them as we continued. In the humid summer night, there wasn't a sound to be heard besides a barn owl that could be heard in a tree nearby and our feet lightly moving across the earth. We reached the dirt road and I raised my head and looked around as what sounded like something heavy fell through a mess of branches, perhaps a decrepit tree or a large animal. Whatever that was, it wasn't small, I heard Ronnie say. I looked over at him and was leaning over his bent knees, wiping his sweaty face off with his dark shirt. He raised up and shook it, attempting to cool off. We four sat in silence, the night now grew more ominous. We stared at the dirt road, and I now looked to the right, remembering the wooden bridge that led to the cemetery. It's this way, I said. We continued walking, I turned around to notice the rest of the group behind me, Justin still holding the flashlight, but aiming it up in the trees rather than the very dark road ahead. Justin, can I see the flashlight? I asked. Here you go, 
he said as he quickly stretched his arm out and held it out like the Olympic torch. We approached the wooden bridge. As we came closer, I looked out at the creek, where you could see a pile of dead hogs, perhaps six or more, on the creek bed. The stench from their rotting, bloated corpses fouled the air. On the bridge was a pentagram drawn out near the very center. It had been faded from the elements, but you could still see it fairly well. We gathered around it, not saying a thing aloud. The cemetery is just up the road, I said. We continued across the bridge, and I noticed that Ronnie turned his head and looked back at the creek where the dead hogs were. Did you guys see that or smell it at least? We continued walking, not thinking too much about it. There could have been many reasons for that. Not every little thing had to be unusual, even to young boys who longed for excitement. As we got closer to the cemetery, we noticed a bright light coming from inside its fence. It was a fire. We rushed down the road, trying our best to stay low and keep quiet as we grew dangerously closer to the cemetery. We got off the road and made our way up a ditch, which led us into the woods that surrounded the cemetery fence line. As we lined up to peer through the fence, we were careful to stay low. Embers lingered around the blaze like fireflies in the cemetery landscape, and we watched as these beings that gathered around the fire. They weren't human. There hadn't been a chance they were human at all. They were beastly, savage creatures that were swift on all fours. When they were on the lookout, they stood on their hind legs and perched, exposing their ape-like chests and torsos. The rest of their bodies looked more canine, like a greyhound. Their faces were covered in heavy-beaked masks that looked similar to the surgeon makes worn during the Black Plague. But these were more of a ghastly sight on such already terrifying monsters. I knew we couldn't dare trespass on their fiery territory. I watched as one lurked near a tombstone and dug like a canine into the ground. I listened as we could hear what sounded like gurgling coming from the plot, dirt being thrown viciously behind the creature. The rest of the pack began to gurgle and click their mouths as they walked around the fire. Three other creatures gathered near the burial plot where the first creature dug, and the other three stood on their hind legs and looked around. I watched as the creature that was now burrowed deep in the ground climbed out of the hole with a rotting arm in its mouth. It sat next to the others, arm between its two hands sniffing. The others gurgled and sniffed in between chirps. Another creature crawled into the hole and came back to the surface with a dismembered leg in its mouth and carried it away from the rest of the group. Justin looked over at the rest of us with a face full of shock and he spoke very hesitantly in an almost faint whisper, trying his best to control his breathing. We've got to get the hell out of here. I don't know what those things are, but they aren't people. I say we leave our stuff at the campsite and get back to my place fast. The four of us backed away from the fence and we got as close to the bottom of the ditch as we could. We knew that any little noise from us could be fatal. The sticky summer air attracted unrelenting mosquitoes that swarmed around our ears and our sweaty necks and arms. We tried for our lives to ignore the high-pitched buzz that rang in our ears as we crept towards the bridge. I heard a gurgling sound in a nearby tree overhead. It rattled and clicked, signaling the others to move in on us. I looked up to see it as, through its frightening mask that covered its disfigured face. It looked down on me with its black dilated pupils as I felt the sweat collect in my eyes and the mosquitoes I refused to away at bite into my neck. The other three were frozen in place, staring at the creature as well. I smelled urine in the air from Ronnie as he couldn't anymore hold his bladder in fear. I couldn't blame him. There wasn't a moment for ridicule or disparagement. The creature stared into our eyes and I heard the fence line viciously rattle as the other creatures climbed and jumped it, closing in on our misfortunate, desperate souls. Justin spoke up. Guys, any ideas? I slowly reached into my pocket and felt for a lighter. In my other pocket was the big can of bear spray. We let them close in on us dangerously to our discomfort, but I knew this was an ample opportunity to quickly discharge as much of the can on them as I could while we still had a chance. I watched as the creatures fell on their backs, croaking and clicking their tongues with this very awful and loud scream that came out in between gurgles and rattles. They nervously clicked more after this. The creature in the tree appeared to fear jumping. It leapt in the opposite direction, scurrying near the cemetery fire. 
we quickly rushed across the bridge, we jumping into the creek near the dead hogs and trudging through the water. It was only five minutes or less to Justin's home. The time we counted down together, not allowing failure to escape the grip of such vile and heinous of creatures. We saw the porch light nearby as we entered into the neighborhood. It had been a welcome relief to know that we had arrived finally. As I reached Justin's patio under the floodlight, I took a moment to catch my breath. I turned my head to look around and I realized I had been the only one who reached my cousin's backyard. I called out each of their names, but without success. I waited around five minutes when I saw the beam of Justin's flashlight shine into the backyard from over the fence. I watched as him and Evan and Ronnie boosted each other over his fence as I continued to walk over to them and ask them what exactly kept them so long. I watched them and something seemed different about their demeanors. They each had a look in their eyes that unnerved me. Justin spoke up. You left us behind. You didn't even let us catch up with you. What the hell were you thinking? He said angrily. I walked in circles looking up at the three of them as they stared at me with unequivocal disapproval nonetheless. After the three of them refused to talk to me that night, I finally decided to walk home. As I got to my room, I quickly stripped to my boxers and fell onto my bed. I woke up around 8.30 in the morning to my father calling out to me from his office, and he said, Tyler, come in here right now. I walked into my father's office. I watched as he held his bald fist over his mouth, leaning back in his leather chair. He ran his other hand through his hair and looked at me. Your cousin and your friends are missing. What happened last night? I thought about it for a moment but hesitated on giving a full disclosure. We just hung out till early this morning and then I came home around 1 o'clock this morning. They were there when I left. Did you go anywhere with them or did they have somewhere they wanted to go? He leaned forward. The only place we went to was the cemetery on Werewolf Road. I found a VHS tape with this bizarre title in a cardboard box, along with dozens of others, that I picked up at a local garage sale for a dollar. The first time I watched it, I wasn't sure what I was looking at. The second time, I knew I had to transcribe what I'd seen for this community. What follows is the content of the Mr. Pause tape, as far as I understand it, with my impressions highlighted in italics. The interior of a van, the resolution isn't as clear as modern video, but also isn't too faded or grainy, suggesting that the tape was recorded in the late 1990s. A stubbly man with black hair checks his dazzling teeth in the camera before focusing on the van's driver. Her thick eyebrows contort as she focuses on the road. The man zooms in until she rolls her eyes, laughs, and pushes the camera back, giving us a view of equipment, luggage, and travel supplies. Man. So, Shelly, are you ready for our first house call? Driver, Shelly. Can it, Travis? You're wasting video. Man, Travis, I, but what about capturing these special little moment? Hey. The video cuts off. When it resumes, we see a small ranch house at the end of a tidy gravel driveway. As the camera zooms in and out, we get the impression that there are no other houses nearby, only low forested mountains. The sun blazes overhead, but a hazy fog still lingers in the shadows between the trees. Their dark presence contrasts with the brightness of the yard, which is a mess of flower beds, lawn ornaments, and colorful plastic toys. The camera pans to the gray exterior of the van where we see Shelley, the driver, in closer detail. She's a stout, muscular woman with a round face and black framed glasses. She wears a yellow sundress and doesn't seem to know what to do with her hands. Shelly. Hi, I'm uh, Shelly Bledsoe and we're in North Carolina today investigating some strange, um, behaviors that, um, wait, fuck. The recording ceases, then resumes. Shelly looks into the camera with a confident smile. Shelly. This is Shelly Bledsoe with Travis Rittenhouse. It's a hot July day here in North Carolina, where we're at the home of Heather Crutcher, one of our readers. She's asked us to look into some strange behaviors she's noticed in her daughter, Cynthia. Let's see what she has to say. We follow Shelly as she crosses the lawn and taps on a screen door. A loud television program clicks off, and a woman with hoop earrings and a wide grin appears out of the gloom. Ma Heather, Shelly, I can't believe it's really you. I had no idea you were coming so early. Heather wraps Shelly in a hug, wreathed in cigarette smoke. 
As Shelly winces and tries to break free, Heather checks her reflection in the screen door glass and adjusts her hair a bit. Shelly, it's good to finally meet Heather. You've sent us a lot of letters about what's been happening with Cynthia. Would you mind to sum up for our viewers? Heather's grin fades and her expression darkens. She glances quickly at the line of trees behind her. She whispers something to herself before turning back to the camera. Heather, a few months ago, Cynthia started spending more and more time out in the woods. At first, I was glad she was getting out. She'd been so clingy since her dad run off, but then she started to change, talking to herself, acting out. I know she's walking around at night because I can hear the floorboards creak. Sometimes she comes into my bedroom and just stands there, breathing. Shelly looks nervously at the camera or maybe at Travis. Heather takes a deep drag on her cigarette. Her hand is shaking. Shelly, have you tried anything to keep your daughter away from the woods? Heather, oh yeah, it's useless. I lock the door, but soon as I turn my back, it's wide open and she's out there again. Shouldn't even be possible, cause I got the only key. If I try to hold her back, she gets bitey. She won't let nothing keep her away from Mr. Paws. Shelly, Mr. Paws? A snort of laughter from Travis. Shelly frowns. It seems she's wondering whether or not coming all the way out here was a good idea after all. Heather, well yeah, that's who Cynthia's spending all her time out there with. Mr. Paws, the dog. Mr. Paws this, Mr. Paws that. She won't shut up about him. Shelly, and have you seen this, um, Mr. Paws? <laughs> Heather, oh yeah, biggest dog you ever seen. Thought he was a black bear at first, he's so big. He gets spooked if anybody other than Cynthia goes near him, though. Runs right off. With a final glance toward the tree line, Heather turns to go inside. Well, you better come on in. I got a room ready. We'll see if you experts can tell me what's going on with my girl. When the recording resumes, we see a small bedroom with wood-paneled walls and a bunk bed. We hear the sound of unpacking in the background and suspect that the camera was turned on by accident. Travis, supernatural creature my ass, what a shit show. We need to call Child Protective Services, not the Ghostbusters. What kind of parent lets a seven-year-old play in the woods with some mangy dog all day? Shelly, it's not easy being a single mom, Travis. We'll know more when we talk to Cynthia. Travis, and if she doesn't try to eat us first, she's probably got rabies. Shelly, keep your voice down. Hey, is that thing on? The film goes dark. Slowly, a sunlit patio with the same yellow wood paneling comes into focus. The furniture and carpet have the style and color of the late 1970s. The remains of a light meal sit on a wicker coffee table in front of Heather and Shelly, who are discussing Shelly's magazine and her plans to finally go audiovisual. Without warning, the conversation stops and Shelly covers her hands with her mouth. And Heather, here she comes. Through the patio screen, the camera zooms in on a tiny figure skipping along the tree line. She has the same wide mouth and dirty blonde hair as Heather, but it is matted and full of twigs. Mud covers her hands and bare feet, and we know this must be Cynthia. As she approaches, she swings a one-armed teddy bear and whistles a hissing, high-pitched tune, almost like a dog whistle. She freezes when she sees the visitors and their camera. Heather. Cynthia, sweetie, this is Shelly from Mommy's Favorite Magazine. She's come a long way to see you. Cynthia, Mr. Paws is hungry. And Heather, Mr. Paws can wait, honey. Why don't you have a seat and say hi to our guests, huh? Cynthia, Mr. Paws is hungry now. Cynthia pushes into the kitchen and grabs a trash bag nearly as big as she is. With a terrible sense of purpose, she shovels the remains of Shelly's meal and any other edible thing she can grab into the bag, then drags it out the door. Heather stares, petrified, but Shelly springs to her feet. Shelly, Cynthia, I'd like to meet Mr. Paws, is that okay? Cynthia, Mr. Paws doesn't like strangers. The recording wobbles as Travis follows Shelly, who is herself following Cynthia, as she drags the trash bag full of refuse toward the woods. Cynthia scowls and bares her teeth at her pursuers, but doesn't otherwise interact. She moves alarmingly fast for a child, Shelly. Cynthia, Cynthia, wait. The trees in front of us are tall poplars with few lower branches, making the space between them appear as an inky, lightless void. 
There is little undergrowth, but something appears to be moving in the ferns. Travis is trying so hard to keep up that he doesn't notice it at first. When he does, he seems to forget about the camera. Travis. Um, Shelly. Shelly, stop. Hey, don't get any closer. Heather wasn't exaggerating when she claimed Mr. Paws was the size of a black bear. The lumbering, furry thing ahead slowly looks toward the camera, which catches the whites of its eyes. Cynthia charges toward it, nuzzles it, and leaps on its back with her trash bag prize. We hear a low, slow growl as Mr. Paws runs off and seems to merge into the dark forest. Finally, even the light in Cynthia's tangled blonde hair is swallowed in the shadows beneath the trees. The camera drops. We only see the high poplar branches swaying in the breeze and hear Travis's wheezing breaths. Travis, oh holy fuck. It is twilight on the patio when filming resumes. The blue bug zapper light gives Heather a ghostly appearance as she lights another cigarette and stares accusingly at Shelly. Heather, Cynthia's never stayed out this late before. It's cause you all are here. Shelly, ma'am, we didn't mean... Travis, why we should call the police. Heather, that's not gonna happen. Those government bastards might try to take my girl from me. Cynthia will come back, you'll see. She always does. We hear a howl from the darkness followed by a child's high-pitched laughter. Heather points at the camera. Heather, do you mind to turn that damn thing off already? Shelly, go ahead, Travis. It's fine, I guess we'll turn in for the night. The screen goes black and stays that way for quite some time. It takes us a few moments to realize that the camera is recording once again. We hear some rustling off screen. Travis and, uh, Shelly, do you hear that? The camera focuses on a small dot of light, a keyhole. A huge black shadow cuts across its golden glow. In another part of the house, we hear a slam, followed by something shattering and a choked scream. We hear the twisting and turning of sheets. Shelly, Travis, did you, did you lock the door? Something large and heavy slams into the door. Shelly screams, another slam, the sound of claws raking wood. The image whirls frantically as Travis rummages for a weapon, a light, anything, a rumbling growl. The next impact splinters the door and knocks it halfway off of its hinges as a light overhead finally flickers on. We see Shelly with her back pressed against the wall and Travis approaching the door with the camera in one hand and a knife in the other. Silence. Shelly, do you think it's gonna... Travis, oh fuck. The camera whirls and we see a child's pale, dirty arms shoving open the bedroom window. Travis rushes to close it again, but a giant hairy paw knocks him away so hard, he topples to the ground. From where the camera lays on its side, we see a shape as black as the night clamor through the window. Somewhere out of sight, Shelly is screaming. The shape rushes her and the screams are replaced by wet tearing sounds. We see Travis attempting to crawl away, but he is suddenly dragged off screen except for his feet, which, eventually, stop twitching. A dark puddle spreads across the floor, and Mr. Paws lumbers into view. We listen to those heaving breaths and observe those bright blue eyes, intelligent and mad and horribly human. We wonder if we are looking at an adult man wearing the skin of an animal a human somehow transformed into a beast, or something else altogether. As the camera is slowly crushed, we realize that it's impossible to tell. I'll update if I learn anything more about what we just saw. In the meantime, I've got some more tapes to watch. There's a place in the backwoods of the high country where there aren't any towns or villages. It's too remote for all but the most rugged of settlers. For those who dare to venture into the dense wilderness of the frontier, they practice caution and security. No one hunts in the forest alone. It's not a very desirable location to be stranded in after the sun goes down. All of the locals know it. There's all manner of enchanted spirits and wild beasts haunting those woods after nightfall. And not all them are benevolent. The mysterious wolves which roam the forest and howl at the moon are said to traverse completely upright on their hind legs. From a distance, they supposedly bear a remarkable resemblance and the erect posture of human beings. Many hunters swear to have witnessed seeing those unnatural creatures lurking about. They are said to surround their prey in highly organized hunting packs, just like ordinary wolves. The primary difference being that they track and trap their prey from a seven-foot-tall, standing vantage point. 
Villagers in the nearby towns are a superstitious lot and took this sinister canine legend to heart. I never gave their fanciful folklore much credence until I saw one of the feral beasts for myself. It crept around an outlying cluster of hardwoods at the edge of the woods near the faded light of dusk. My jaw dropped and the hairs on my neck raised up. As soon as it saw me, it wrinkled its snout in an aggressive, toothy snarl. I feared that I was going to have to fend off a violent attack, but in the end, it retreated away slowly. I'll never forget the startling sight of a fully standing werewolf, massive in size, stepping backward into the safety of the tree line. What black magic sorcery or mysterious act of the Lord was this? The fierce look in its coal black eyes spoke volumes. You stay inside your territory and I'll stay within mine, was the message. Being so close to the wretched thing filled me with a chilling dread. Could I really trust that it and its brethren would hold true to the unspoken truce? I had no way of knowing, but from that day forward, I forbade my children from stepping foot into the woods after sundown. Even the most obedient children are apt to misunderstand or not take parental warnings seriously. In the back of my mind, I always carried a lurking fear of the possible consequences. Naturally, my sons and daughters failed to understand the true reason for my strict, unexplained directive. I didn't even try to tell them about the horrible abomination I'd witnessed. Being labeled a forbidden place made it even more tantalizing. I caught all of them stealing longing glances at it from time to time. The devilish mystique of an unfamiliar territory was slowly seducing them. Each day the temptation wore down their resistance a little beat more. The greeter, the opposition I raised to the damned labyrinth of beckoning trees, the heavier, their curiosity bore upon them. All too soon, the situation I dreaded came true. I awoke to find that my eldest two children couldn't resist the allure of the woods any longer. They had crept outside to explore it, apparently. Their beds were vacant, the candle box was missing, and the hen eggs were still uncollected from their chicken coop chores. Calling our their names at the edge of the woods proved futile. They had too much of a head start wandering the dense highlands. I gathered up my rifle and gunpowder pack for the unpleasant task ahead. An occasional drip of congealed wax upon fallen leaves confirmed their path. I was relieved to feel that it was still a bit warm to the touch. That was a sign they weren't too far ahead. By mid-morning, I had picked up and lost their trail several times. Other things were active along the well-worn deer path. The disturbed leaves and brush I found wasn't proof of their presence any longer. They would have blown out the melting candle with the full rise of the sun. From there, the wax trail went cold. I yelled and shouted their names until I was hoarse. Only a mocking echo bouncing off the nearby canyons answered me back. I considered doubling back to the last confirmed evidence of their trek, but an unknown force inside me kept pushing onward. In the blackest heart of the highlands, only wisps of sunlight can trickle down to the leaf-strewn floor below. I was deeper in the forest than I'd ever been into the dense wooded canopy. Suddenly, I felt a significant presence nearby. A dark entity was watching. I turned to face the same ferocious mongrel which had haunted my nightmares since the first day I saw it. This time, the standing alpha leader of the pack wasn't alone. I was surrounded by a half dozen other attack-ready wolves. He snarled while the others remained silent in hierarchical respect. I had my gun at the ready, but could only take out one of them before the rest pounced on me. He was the obvious choice for my musket volley. When the leader of any rank and file organization falls, the underlings often panic. Regardless, I wasn't likely to make it out of the woods alive. I thought deeply about the circumstances which led me there. I had been the one who violated the agreement and broke the rules. I was in their territory. Against every instinct I held dear, I lowered my weapon as a sign of contrition. The posture of the pack immediately changed. The alpha male stepped back slightly. Then all the others followed suit, breaking the tense stalemate. Eventually, they all fell back out of sight. To much greater surprise, my two missing children appeared from the same general direction. I surmised that the majestic wolves who walk upright had been holding them captive until I came to answer for their careless trespass. 
I was glad that I found a peaceful resolution to being cornered by them. I am sure there would have been a very different outcome otherwise. My children and I walked back home in virgin silence. No angry words needed to be spoken, nor threats made. I saw the mortal depth of fear and greater understanding in their remorseful eyes. Never again would I have to worry about them or their younger siblings wandering into the Highland woods. No doubt they would impart the importance of honoring the territorial border with my two youngest children. It was a valuable lesson for all of us. It took me 12 nights to figure out what the littlest werewolf wanted from me. I'd stand in the sheep pasture at twilight and glare at her as she crouched in the sagebrush, her unblinking golden eyes tracking my every step. My old sheepdog Zeus would bark and claw in the red dust, agitated and protective yet too lazy to make chase. But the wolf never tried to steal a sheep. She never moved at all. At least, not unless I broke her gaze and looked away for a moment. Then I'd glance back, and she'd be gone, in an instant disappearing into the pinion and juniper trees of the Hummingbird Hills, that sunless thicket where the less benevolent of the gods were rumored to lurk. I'd stand quietly and listen to her mournful howl bring down the moon, a bee wailing that echoed through the canyons and vibrated the dry grass beneath my feet. Kill the white man seemed to be her lament carried on the cool night winds. Kill him. Her words confounded me. There were certainly no white men around here. Living in a remote pueblo in the desert canyonlands of northern Arizona, the only white men I ever encountered were the occasional sheriff's deputy or government agent, well-intentioned Mormon missionaries promising a marvelous afterlife, or anthropologists fascinated by our complex pantheon. All of these visitors were politely escorted away. Even still, the presence of the little wolf bedeviled me for I quickly understood that I was the only one who had yet seen or heard her. A real wolf, Papa, my youngest daughter Ariadne asked me one morning as I told her and her sisters the story over breakfast. Or a creature quite like it, I said, finishing my cereal with one hand, stirring sugar into my coffee with the other. I reckon there's a breath of something primate and conscious in there. What makes you think she's not all wolf? My middle daughter Antiope asked. She crouches in the same place every day and never looks at the sheep. She watches me alone, with the saddest of eyes. Her ears flick at the sound of my voice, and her own howl is unusually expressive and forlorn. But a human can't howl, my oldest daughter Arachne declared. Maybe she's a god in disguise outside winking at her, or their half-human child, the daughter of a wolf god, born to a human mother who feared it so much she abandoned it in the desert to die. My wife Leah suddenly dropped her coffee mug. It shattered on the floor, and I turned in surprise. I hadn't noticed her there, standing at the stove, listening to the conversation. What do you think it is, Mama? Antiope asked her unconcerned. Leah shrugged and took a sip of her coffee from the mug in her hands. I looked, but saw no broken mug. I blinked, figuring I'd only imagined the loud smash and the fragmented splinters of earthenware. Isn't the Fish and Wildlife Service reintroducing gray wolves around here? She said. They're trying to clear the overpopulation of deer at the Grand Canyon. Maybe one of those wolves wandered across. Maybe, I agreed, but this one speaks to me, I think. Just like Auntie Cassandra, Ariadne said, she hears the wind speak to her in human words. It makes her twitch and fall down asleep. And behind her eyes, she sees the faces of the gods who make the wind. Cassandra's mind is very ill, Leah said. Leave her alone, and leave the wolf alone. If it is a god, it's best not to meddle in whatever task it must complete. Would anyone like some coffee? The brewer steamed and hissed. The radio buzzed and hummed the morning news and the weather reports. I had to admit, I couldn't dispute my wife's assertion, but I didn't want to believe it. I couldn't get the narrative out of my head of the little cub with a mortal mother and a divine father, a child with an uncanny inclination towards turning canine when the moon rose in the sky. It brought a little spark of thrill to the slow turn of life, the life of society's outliers, out among the barren, rust-colored desert. Letting my imagination run wild, I thought of my son somewhere far from home, being cared for by the spider god who called him her beloved. I gazed at my daughters, 
young and vulnerable, yet so untamed and wild. I thought of the human mother who might at this moment be wondering where her little, half-divine wolf cub was huddling, imagining her child lost among the old trees and the voices of the night. Was she scared? Was she hungry? Was she shivering with cold in these crisp autumn evenings after the sun went down, yearning for the familiar warmth of home? I loved my own children more than anything. I understood that primal, animalistic urge to protect one's defenseless offspring. My heart softened towards the staring and unmoving cub. Her origins were an enigma to me. But, were she my own daughter, I'd certainly hope another parent would be there to keep a vigilant eye on her and listen to her unspoken desires. The next evening, I began to bring small scraps of mutton and elk jerky to the wolf girl. She'd cower if I walked too close, pulling back her lips to show me her gleaming white fangs. Kill the white man, she rasped in a voice like radio static. First, you must eat. I whispered affectionately. Then you may kill whatever ghosts you happen to find. I was often close enough to smell her only briefly. She carried the sweet scent of burning sagebrush and tobacco in her fur. Once, I thought I saw a single tiny glistening tear emerge from her sunken eye and roll down her snout. Kill him, she howled from afar. Kill what man, I asked. There is no white man here, only me, and I'm the only one who knows you're here. Why won't you let me help you? She stared, silent as ever, but she didn't run from me that evening. Encouraged by her sprouting interest in being nurtured, I turned up a few old baby blankets. Within their folds, I tucked bits of fragrant lavender and soothing catnip. I left them under a pinion tree near the border, to the dense forest of the hummingbird hills. I'd taken care of her hunger and her shivering. All I could do now was try to heal her loneliness, to take her somewhere warm and inviting and reunite her with the family from whom she surely must have been forced to depart. But that was not to be. On the twelfth day, I was paid a visit by a deputy of the county sheriff. I was spending a lazy autumn day in the kitchen garden, checking the tall stalks of blue corn for ripeness, pulling back the husks to get a swift glimpse of their deep indigo kernels, their rare beauty, as hidden and lustrous as a dragon's cachet of jewels. For a moment, I imagined myself the hero of that story slaying the dragon and stealing its bounty. He didn't see me watching him as he drove up the winding road that spiraled around the mesa on which our pueblo was perched. His clunky white pickup truck rumbled and roared across the ancient bridge of bones that connected Mercury Mesa to Jupiter Mesa and followed the dusty red road to where I stood. A fat husk gripped too tightly in my hands. Deputy Babbitt got out of the truck and faced me, covering the gun on his hip watching my hands, avoiding my eyes. Babbitt didn't much care for people like me. We didn't much care for deputies. Sir, he nodded, trying to look casual in a place so backward and foreign to a white man. He swept off his sun-bleached cowboy hat and leaned against the hood of the truck, stubbing out his cigarette with his pale leather boot. How's everything going around the farm? How's your wife and that beehive of daughters? I looked over my shoulder to make sure my family was safe inside the house. I remembered then that Leah had taken the children along to see the traveling carnival in Kanab. Zeus was probably asleep in the sheep pasture. Mr. Beartooth, Babbitt said when I didn't answer. I've heard a rumor that you've spotted a wolf nearby, one that's stalking your sheep and eating your food. Rumor, I said, gossip, certainly. There haven't been wolves around here for 50 years. You ought to know that. Who told you I'd seen a wolf? Cassandra Maldonado. She won't speak to me, but I heard her young daughter's gone missing, and I believe the girl may have been dragged away by the wolf your kids are telling everyone about. Poor Cassandra. Her daughter was all she'd had, but if there was anyone who craved utter solitude, it was Cassandra. She lived a hermetical life on the dusty outskirts of the Pueblo, with only her cows for company, and we all assumed that's the way she wanted it. I myself had always been uneasy around her, never sure what to say or where to look when I'd bring her gifts of surplus peaches, and she'd begin to yelp and swear and convulse. But we all avoided her back then. We told ourselves it was what she needed. I was vaguely sorry to hear her child was missing. I'd forgotten she had a child. I turned my back on the sheriff's deputy and back to my corn. I've told you all I know, I said to him, my fingers idly digging at the brittle husks not knowing even what they were doing. 
I hoped he wouldn't see my hands shaking. I think it's time for you to leave, deputy. Babbitt was quiet for a long moment. Well, I have the feeling there's something else you're not telling me, he said, his voice as low and discordant as a rattlesnake's tail. I clenched my jaw. I waited. We opened and closed a corn husk again and again, entwining my fingers in the gossamer green tassel, feeling the taut bulge of milk beneath the swollen kernels. I glanced at the garden shears on the opposite side of the garden, imagining the crunch they'd make as they sheared off the man's nicotine-stained fingers. There was a sound of a door opening and closing. I turned around again. Deputy Babbitt was dragging a brownish-gray bundle from the bed of his truck. His hands and his white jacket were stained with its blood. I knew right away what I was seeing. Its fur was matted and dirt-clogged, its caved-in side was stained with a rust-colored smudge. Its tongue hung out of a mangled snout, and its amber eyes stared straight ahead, into my own eyes, as they always had, never breaking that line of sight. Babbitt dropped it heavily on the ground, and finally stared at me forthright. Don't you ever lie to me like that again, he hissed into my face. I've just done you a favor by shooting this dangerous animal, and now I expect to be thanked, not deceived. I put my life in danger for your flock, for your wife, for your children. You don't have to like me, but you do have to respect me. That's all I ask. There are worse predators out there than this one, and you have no idea what I've done for you. To let you let you people quarantine yourselves up here without interference. My family has lived in Arizona for a century, civilizing this barren dust bowl, trying to guide your people into the modern world, and all we get back from you is suspicion and scruple. Now don't you dare take my protection for granted and ruin it for the ones that want progress and improvement. Don't you dare violate that tenuous trust I've been generous enough to give, even as I overlook your flaws. Don't you dare. I glared straight ahead, our faces so close I could smell the remains of his cigarette and his white mustache. I did not sever my gaze with his. I thought of the littlest werewolf, speaking through the silence, pleading with her eyes. He couldn't hold for long, he kicked the wolf's body with his white boot. So that's all you've got? He growled. No thanks, no gratitude. Does this dead menace mean nothing to you? You are nothing to me, I said. One day you too will lie in the sand, but you won't get a burial nearly as grand as hers. Your mouth will fill with dust and cornmeal. Your tongue will be replaced by a scorpion's tail. Your eye sockets will be the nursery for a rattlesnake's eggs. Your ribs will be made hollow by the sun and will whine in the wind like a bone flute. Is that a threat, he said, backing away, or a curse? Neither, I said. It's an expectation, an aspiration, an invocation. He gritted his teeth, and then he turned, smashed his hat back onto his head, and got into his truck. I waited for him to cross the bone bridge before I turned and crouched at the side of the little wolf girl, another father's daughter, my pollen-covered fingers stroking her ears, still soft, still listening to words carried on a wind that blew from another world the land of the dead. I lay there until the sun set. Then I carried her down the mesa and buried her at the edge of the sheep pasture, the place where I'd first seen her, waiting, quietly begging me to listen to her wolf words. I smudged her nose and forehead, with all the corn pollen remaining on my hands as one does to both the newly dead and the newly born, as I had done to all my children, and later to my father. Zeus watched for a while, sitting on his haunches, before he finally let out a low, woolulating howl that echoed off the hills and resonated through the canyons and reverberated in the craters of the luminous silver moon. He led me back home where Leah and the children had already gone to bed. In the night I woke, feeling as if I'd heard my name whispered in a dream. I rolled over to watch the moon out the window, but the clouds had gathered, covering it in a pearlescent shroud. Hephaestus, a voice called to me into the stillness in the holy dark, a voice that sounded like Cassandra's. Hephaestus, she was pregnant. Too young to be, I said, and could not contain my tears. She was only thirteen. Too young, I said again, too gentle to endure the immorality straight up. Was she, was she born human, not a wolf? Fully human, Cassandra whispered, deeply loved. Who transformed her? The voice was silent. I looked down at Leah asleep next to me, untroubled by the whispers. I wondered if I had only dreamt the conversation, for immediately it was lost in the haze of linear time, 
just like the coffee mug that had never shattered. Soon I too slept again, a restless doze that allowed my mind to walk barefoot across the desert sands, leaving no footprints, wandering under a swiftly spinning sky whose stars had no names. The following morning, I found the body of Deputy Babbitt at the far end of the sheep pasture. He had been scalped, flayed, and disemboweled, his entrails making spirals and curlicues in the dust. His throat had been torn out, left in bloody tatters of oozing, putrefying shreds of flesh. His genitals had been torn almost completely from his body, left dangling and mangled. His toenails and fingernails had been yanked out of their bleeding cuticles. His mouth, open in an eternal scream of agony, was stuffed with dried sagebrush and cactus thorns. His ribcage, splayed open to reveal a half-eaten heart and lungs, made a wailing keening noise that swelled and receded with the icy wind. I looked at my fingertips, again dusted with corn pollen, then I wiped my hands on my jeans and did not touch the dead man's forehead. From afar I felt myself being watched. I turned. Mm -hmm. Watching me from the other side of the fence was an enormous wolf with green eyes that wept human tears. Its fur was black all over, like a person in mourning. It gazed at me not with fear or caution as the young one had, but with attentive rage. Who are you? I asked, holding its gaze, my hand on the hunting knife at my hip. It ought to be your wife lying there in the dirt, rotting alongside the man, said the black wolf in a voice like the whispers I had heard in the clouded night. Your dispute is not with Leah, I said. She's done nothing wrong. Leah never asked my permission to transform my daughter, said the black wolf. She acted hastily, and by the time I found out what happened, she could not undo what she had done. My Ida didn't have to die. She didn't have to suffer in the cold night alone and starving, wondering why this perversion had been put upon her. I don't understand, I said. I loved my daughter, I loved her, she was all I had. I would have loved her baby in a way that nobody in this desert ever loved me. You've all rejected and abandoned me, forced me to live far away from everyone. You hated Ida for her slow mind and slow speech. You hated me for the way I twitched and fainted. Yet still, I had no desire to be a wolf. Magic in the hands of one with an unsound mind is perilous. But when the deputy came around talking rumors about my Ida, I transformed myself anyway to be close to my little one forever. And now it's too late. You've all killed her. The black wolf stepped closer to me. Leah stole something from me in more ways than one. She stole it to carry out her private vengeance on the white man, but my own vengeance is not complete. Warn your wife that when I see her again, I will tear her apart piece by piece. I will prolong her suffering for years as I replace her human body with this wolf's body. I refuse to become human again until I've been satisfied. Then she stood on her hind legs, becoming as tall and straight-backed as the tallest human. She bolted into the overgrown woods of the Hummingbird Hills to where the sun refused to shine. I confronted Leah that night by the fireplace. Don't keep secrets from me like that, I said softly, restraining my impatience, my indignation. I had every right, she said. It's not the first and won't be the last. Why, Leah, why did you turn Ida into a wolf? You're not a shaman or a witch. You have no right to be using magic against a child. Why would you do something so contemptible? Leah was listening to a record of Bach violin sonatas while she drank watermelon wine straight from the bottle. Its sweet smell couldn't overtake the steely scent of blood that saturated the room. She set it down hard on the wooden floor and looked me straight in the eye. I was protecting Ida. When Cassandra showed me the black moth encased in amber, a gift she'd claimed to have been given by the wolf god Whitepaws, she swore it would turn me into a wolf. I could finally kill Babbitt with no consequences, as I had wanted to do for so long. But I found that I couldn't. I had too much to lose. I have a home, and children, and a job. Instead, when I saw Ida was pregnant, I gave the piece of amber to her and changed her into a wolf. I forbade her from telling her mother and I sent her out into the desert to hunt that lowlife scum. Protecting her from what? You seem to have tied a knot even you cannot untangle. I told you Ida was pregnant. Who do you think was the father of her child? And who do you think is Ida's father too? 
The deputy, I said, suddenly feeling small and simple for not making the connection until now. Ida had always been more light-skinned than the rest of us, and we had mistrusted her because of it. What an abomination for a man to beget a child on his own daughter. I gave Ida a gift, Leah continued, the gift of carrying out vengeance. The only gift I could give that would match the generosity of a wolf god. I would have wanted that privilege for myself years ago. I was younger than she when Babbitt raped me, and my rage had a knife's edge. I raged because I was powerless, and his power is so unbounded that he killed Ida anyway, not to protect himself from the accusation, but because he could. Eventually, he would have found some other girl to victimize, and then, what would we do? Turn all our girls into a colony of bats? Would you want to see your own daughters hanging upside down in a cave all day, unable to live a beautiful life in the sunshine? I admit I used magic that did not belong to me, and which I had no right to try to control. But you need to understand that I only intended to protect the girl. I told Ida she must be the one to slay Babbitt, to force him to look into her eyes in the moment of his death, to regret his actions, to understand that the consequences were finally catching up with him. And once he was dead, I promised Ida I would find a way to make her human again. She never had the heart to kill him, I said. Too gentle a soul, abused until she had no will of her own. Too meek to stain her teeth with blood. Her blood is on your hands. He faced us, Leah said, again changing the subject. What about your role? Ida was begging you to kill the deputy. The white man. The white man in the white truck with the white hat and the white boots. Why didn't you do it once you saw that she had failed to take him down? He was here the day she was shot. You didn't tell me. But I could smell his scent all over the ground when I arrived home. Nobody would have seen you cut his throat. Nobody would have known. The gods would have devoured the body and protected you from the consequences, had you asked. Why didn't you avenge me, avenge Ida, avenge all his past and future victims? Why didn't you listen to her cries? You overlooked her human desires and ignored what she was saying with her human voice. You treated her like some spoiled household dog who only wants a bed and a belly rub. Don't lay the burden of shame on me, I said. You misled me. You told me she was an ordinary wolf and to leave her alone. How could I have known Ida would fail? Clearly, I'm not as clever or powerful as you think me to be. Leah scowled. A child is dead, she said, and all you care about is shifting the blame to anyone but yourself. You sound an awful lot like Babbitt right now. You're wrong, I fumed. I have been humbled, Leah, and I believe you are the merciless one. You use magic stolen from a vulnerable mother and left a little girl in a body she didn't want. You forced a child to fight your battle and now Cassandra will be forever stalking you. She has her canine stare fixed on you, on your every move. One day, she'll pounce and take her revenge on you and she will tear you apart piece by piece, year after year, and replace your body with a wolf's and I will never be powerful enough to protect you. I can't. The blanket around her shoulders fell. She quickly pulled it back up, but not before I saw a flash of the gray brown of a wolf's furry foreleg, hastily stitched onto the bleeding stump of her elbow with greasy sinew. I looked up from the fresh wound. I met her eyes and she glared back at me, eyes fiery up, but I could not hold her gaze. I bent my head and I hid my face in my hands. Play summer. 1986. We were driving through the Rocky Mountains on our way to Array. There were three of us, Steve, Danny, and me. We were young, dumb, and fed up with what life was really like after college. So we bought some matches, packed a cooler of beer, food and beer, and loaded up my trusty Toyota with all the fixings for a classic camping trip. This trip was supposed to shake up the devastating monotony of our daily life, and shake us up it did, to the very core. Right before we were getting ready to set out, Steve's mom ran out of the house and told him he should take their newly adopted family dog, Luna, for safety. Steve was hesitant. He didn't want to have to look after the dog, especially if we were going to be drinking. And she was a big dog, a mixed husky, and something else. Great Dane, maybe. But his mom insisted until finally he broke and agreed to take her. Luna looked up at him with her warm blue eyes and seemed to smile. Steve sighed and said, I guess I'll sit in the back with her. No, no, I said, walking over and patting her head. Let her sit up front with me. She wagged her tail. 
Most of the car ride went smoothly, and we sang along to the radio, mooed at cows, and waved at, or flipped off, motorcyclists. But as we neared our destination, and the sun sank behind us, leaving us in a thick, almost tangible darkness, we started to become jumpy, pointing at strange shadows and swift movements. Luna, though, was curled up and asleep beside me, unaware of our growing fear. The sky was covered in big roiling clouds that blew swiftly towards the east, covering and revealing the full moon at random intervals. By now, we were the only vehicle on the road. My headlights barely sliced the darkness around us as we weaved our way through the mountains. The isolation, the darkness, the silence, it was all so crushing. Steve, I thought you said we would be there before the sunset. I told you we shouldn't have stopped at that bar. Not oh, Danny, I didn't know we'd be there for that long. You wouldn't stop your stupid pool game. And I won, come on, it's not that dark out. Would some money make you happy? You ash. Hey, cool it, look, what the hell is that? I slowed the car down to a stop, trying to see what was blocking the road, but the light from the cloud-covered moon was too dim. What the hell? Danny, I whispered as she rolled down her window. I was apprehensive, worried this was someone's attempt to rob us, or worse. I had heard all the urban legends before. I just want to see better. She stuck her head out of the window, and I rolled a little bit closer. Luna, feeling the change in the car's movement, lifted her head and sat up, panting. It's a, oh shit, I think it's a dead deer, you guys, gross. Danny retreated back inside the car and rolled the window back up. Who the hell just leaves something like that on the road? Assholes, Steve said, then leaned forward. Hey man, think you can drive around it? Yeah, yeah, I think I can. I approached the thing, now seeing the antlers and the gleaming black eyes, open, staring, dead. It blinked. I yelped and jerked the steering wheel, side-swiping the mountainside. Shit. What the hell, man? A cow mare, it's alive. What? That fucking deer, it's alive. As I spoke, the deer lifted its head and bleated. The sound echoed around the chasm. We all jumped and watched as it pushed itself up, up, up until it was standing on its hind legs like a man, but uncanny grotesque. Mesmerized, we sat unable to move as the thing walked over to us, slowly, decidedly, as if walking on two legs was a thing this deer did often. It leaned down next to Danny's window, its face so close to the glass that steam from its nose fogged it up. A low noise rang out through the car. Luna was growling, her hackles raised, crouched in the seat next to me a bang. The thing rammed its head into the window, chaos erupted. Danny screamed, piercing high. Luna started barking, booming, persistent. Steve yelled, telling me to fucking go, just go. I, shaking, struggled with the clutch, stalling, 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 bang. <laughs> the window cracked and the thing starting making an incredible sound. It sounded like a weird screeching guttural form of laughter. Hey. Finally, the clutch caught and I sped the hell out of there. I checked the rear view and saw the thing standing on two legs looking after us. Suddenly, it leapt forward and began running after us. It ran on two legs instead of four and it was fast. So fucking fast and I drove as fast as I could on that winding mountain road. But, despite my speed, the thing still caught up with us. It tapped its antlers on my window and screeched that weird laughter again. Then it pointed at front of us, bared its teeth and stopped. The abruptness of how quickly it disappeared caught me off guard. Watch out. I snapped forward, and what I saw made me slam on my brakes. A house, a fucking house in the middle of the road. I guess it was more of a cottage or a hut, but there it was, clear, vivid, in front of us. Danny was audibly crying in the back seat, repeating what the fuck, over and over to herself. Steve was breathing heavily, like he had just run a marathon. Luna was whimpering beside me and scratching at the window. Nausea enveloped me made worse by the vibration from my pounding heart. Seriously, what the fuck is going on? I think I'm going to puke, man. Don't fucking open that door, just back up, turn around, man, let's go back. Towards that thing, no fucking way, man. Well, if you didn't fucking notice, there's a goddamn house in front of me. Just drive through it, come on. No, 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 no. Danny, calm down, it's okay, we're okay, we'll be okay. Danny simpered and started sobbing again. Shut the fuck up, Danny, please. Guys, guys, look, oh god, I the house, it was spinning slowly, and stopped when the front of it pointed directly at my car. 
The door to the house slammed open, emitting a sound like a gunshot. A single point of light emerged from the darkness inside the house. A candle, and holding it up was a figure stooped over, covered in what looked like blackened rags. It began to approach us, lurching forward swift, then slow, then swift, again. It was making this eerie, deep staccato sound. Are you for real right now? Steve was leaning forward, peering out the windshield. Let's go. Reverse. The thing is behind us. Hunter, run it over. L look, look, Danny screamed. The stooped figure was now running at full speed straight at us. It slammed onto my hood and we could finally see that it was an old, old woman, covered in wrinkles, completely bald, with sharpened yellow teeth. She was moaning and moaning. My she crawled up the hood, opened her mouth and licked the glass, leaving a trail of blood-colored saliva. Luna went wild, barking, foaming at the mouth, throwing herself at the door. Please, 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 back up, back up now. I slammed my foot on the gas, but my tires made a sickening sound, and the smell of burnt rubber slipped into the car. It's behind us, it's fucking behind us. I turned back to see the deer's head, teeth still bared, peering at me from the back window. Shit, fuck, what do we do, what do I do? Luna, no. With a final lunge, Luna forced the door open, it sounds shocking, but she was such a large dog and strong. A powerful wind picked it up and the roiling clouds dispatting, allowing the light from the full moon to illuminate the scene in front and behind, use. Luna was as still as a statue, slightly crouched, poised to leap. The hackles on her back quivered, and a single thread of drool spun itself down from her mouth. She began to shake, faster and faster. It looked like she was having a seizure. The old woman and the deer thing were both looking over at her. Something strange was happening to Luna. It looked as if her limbs were breaking, elongating. Her snout narrowed, sinking closer to her face. She rose up onto her hind legs, humanoid, and howled up towards the sky before locking eyes with the hag on my car. In the blink of an eye, Luna was on the woman, ripping her away, shaking her to and fro in her jaw like a rag doll. Luna flung the woman towards the house and she struck it with some force and didn't get back up. The house and the woman, vanished in a puff of smoke. Luna turned towards the thing behind us. It screeched, raising itself up to its full height, challenging her. Luna howled again, then licked her fangs. The thing took two steps towards her before turning tail and fleeing down the road, Luna giving chase. They both ran on two legs, instead of four. We sat in total silence for a few moments until I leaned over and slammed the passenger side door closed. Um, uh, I think Danny passed out. Zip. I turned to look at Steve. He looked at me. Let's get out of here, man. We got two miles before the thunk, thunk, thunk beneath us. Couldn't be ignored any longer. A flat tire. I pulled over and we eyed the darkness around us, paranoid. I'm not changing it. I'm not going out there, Steve said loudly. Don't worry, there's no spare. Uh, what? I took it out to make room for all the camping stuff. Are you fucking kidding me? Nope. Well, what the hell do we do now? Mesonero didn't know. Suddenly, like magic, like a miracle, headlights appeared behind us. A godsend. A car. I hope they're normal. Me too. Should we tell them? We locked eyes again. No. If they bring it up. Maybe. If it's a cop. Definitely not. He'll think we're high. The car rolled up beside us. It was totally black with tinted windows. The window rolled down, and behind it sat a middle-aged man. He looked tired, maybe sad. Need some help? Oh, thank God. Steve whispered. Yes, flat tire, don't have a spare. Well, that's dumb, the man said. You should always carry a spare, always. Never know what could happen. Lucky for you, I think I have one that will fit your car. You joking? The man shook his head and hopped out of his car. He was dressed sharply. Black suit, black tie, black shoes, all covered by a trench coat. Come on, you can hold the flashlight for me. I hesitated, then exited the car. What happened here? He pointed to the window next to Danny's head. Oh, um, it's been like that for a while. Dumb neighbor kid hit it with a baseball. Uh-huh. The man nodded, and her. Tired, just tired. We've been driving for a while. Driving where? Meet trees, hurry for camping. Nice place. We've heard. Say, the man said, releasing the jack. Job done. Seen anything weird tonight? My heart sped up and I looked around us half expecting the deer or the woman or Luna to come sprinting towards us. 
What do you mean weird? Oh, I don't know anything out of the ordinary. Mum, no, why? Oh, no reason, just heard some spooky tales. Tales? That the natives who used to live around here would tell. What tales? The man stood up and dusted his hands off on his coat. Well, he said, ignoring my question. You're all set. You're about 20 minutes out from Uray and two hours from the sunrise. I'd advise you get a move on. Never know what might be stalking you out there. I'm headed the same way, actually. I can drive behind you if you like. A muffled yes came from inside the car, and we both looked up to see Steve nodding voraciously. Yeah, that would be great, actually. The corners of the man's mouth twitched a bit as he nodded, sliding back into his car. We drove to Ure without incident, and as soon as we hit the city, the man in the car behind us flashed his brights twice, then flipped a U-turn, speeding back down the way we came. I thought he said he was going this way, I said, looking in my rear view. Who cares, let's get a hotel room and leave first thing tomorrow morning, Danny said. She had woken up as we were driving towards Ure. We filled her in on the strange man and how he helped us, but she was still spooked and jumpy. And we did just that. We didn't dare camp in the wilderness or even leave the relative safety of the town. On the way back to civilization, we swore to never tell anyone what happened. It was too weird, uncanny, horrifying. Steve was silent, afraid of what his mom might say or do about Luna. We made up some story about how she had fallen over a cliff after chasing a deer. Poor Luna. We did stop for an hour, around the area it happened, and called out to her, but to no avail. We never saw her again. It's been years since this happened, and I'm old now. The three of us lost touch after we returned from the trip, but vowed to keep this secret to our death. Last I heard, Steve died from a heart attack, and Danny was diagnosed with stomach cancer. I figured it's about time I shared my tale. Maybe it'll help me make some semblance of sense out of it. In the end, though, I don't know if those things were protecting us from her, or if she was protecting us from them. I guess I'll never know. Sometimes, late at night, when I hear howling, I like to imagine it's Luna out there somewhere running free in the wild. <laughs>